Good morning and welcome to everyone who are joining this online summit organized by the Earth Journalism Network of Internews. Let's give a few minutes to everyone so they can join and for more people to join this event and then we will begin. Thank you to everyone who are joining. We thank you if you can write your name, where you're from, and what organization you belong to in the chat. We will begin in one more minute. Thank you to everyone who is joining. We have people from Guatemala and Brazil, Ecuador. Thank you very much. Welcome to everyone. Very well. Thank you very much. Who is joining this webinar online organized by the Earth Journalism Network, DJN. And I have the pleasure of moderating. My name is Lucy Calderon Pire. I'm from Guatemala. And what, mentor of stories for Latin America. I come in that this webinar has simultaneous importation to English and Portuguese. To select the language of your preference, you only have to click an icon at the inferior part of the screen. Click on it and you can select the language of your preferral. DJN has the mission of increasing the amount and quality of environmental reports, and it does it through supporting journalism, providing them with submissions for their journalistic reports, get training so they can in person or virtual trainings that are organized by seminars and forums such as these and many other activities. DJN is a community of 20,000. If you wish to be part of this incredible network and you still haven't, you just have to visit our website, Earth Journalism Network .net, and register. By doing so, you'll be the first to receive information regarding our callings. Okay. To carry out the issue that has um, gathered us, do we have two fine speakers and we thank them for their generosity in being present today because they'll be sharing us with this information on this subject based on their professional trajectory and experience. I will present all three and when I finish presenting them, they will have their intervention in that same order. When finalizing our third panelist, I will open the floor for questions and answers from the audience. Those who have questions, please write them and the question answer option on this platform, not on the chat, because we will not be monitoring the chat, but the Q&A. Okay, today's seminar is about how can resilience 
the coast resilience work in Latin America, we know the region is confronting various environmental issues such as drought, um, flooding, lack of water, and land erosion. Apart from extractive activities such as deforestation and mining, the list goes on. However, the issues due to climate change on the coast don't receive the attention that they deserve, even though a report from 2021 from the World Meteorology Organization revealed the sea levels is rising more than other regions of the world. Likewise, we know that the uh, flooding in Brazil in 2021 provoked estimated losses at $100 million and hundred, hundreds of people were displaced. According to the Nature Conservancy, the Caribbean coast of Mexico has lost about 80% of live coral. When we lose coral, we lose the natural barrier against hurricanes and storms. However, the communities and the responsible individuals, such as the politicians, are in the first line for the solution to accept um, changes of resilience. To speak about this, we have our panelists who will offer their vision according to their experience. And the goal is that the audience can have more ideas to produce important journalism, to focus on prevention. We don't wanna produce journalism when the disaster occurs. We want to foment the culture of prevention in our communities. Our first panelist is Tanya Ovi Martinez, a journalist and professor of scientific journalism in the San Francisco de Quito, Ecuador University. To her coverage in health and environment, she specialized in scientific journalism. She's a correspondent for Red Cybernet, ambassador of the Inter-University of Ecuadorian Means. She edits magazines and digital contents. In 2014, she won the first journalism prize in Mexico with the Explora Conciencia project. In 2008, she created the scientific magazine in science for the University of the Armed Forces. She has worked as a journalist in health in the Vanguardia magazine, and she was a reporter for the Expresso. Now she is part of the Mexican network of scientific journalism. Next, we have Dr. Victor Garcia, professor. Uh, doctor in his profession, has a master's in public health, and is a specialist with a lot of experience in incorporation of risk management in development processes. Dr. Garcia is the current president of the University Network of the Americas and the Caribbean for the reduction of disaster risk reduction. Regular. Our third panelist is Maria Rosario Calderon, professional translator who has over 20,000 experience in communication and development and public areas and business area. Maria del Rosario has worked in international entities such as the United Nations entity, the International Organization for Migration, the Nature Conservancy, the World Fund for Nature, and is currently the senior official of communications for the World Fund of Nature. Mesoamerica chapter, who's in, she's in charge of the strategic planning of communication for this office and for the different projects that she executes. Thank you very much to our panelists. And I give the word to Tanya, who will give us her vision about the media coverage of the coast resilience in the region. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you for being here. Good morning to everyone. Greetings to all of our colleagues who our colleagues who are present today with us. Thank you very much, dear Lucy, for the invitation and for the DJ. And of course, I will be brief and concrete due to time, due to that we have uh, a deadline that we have to fulfill. I will share my screen. I have a brief presentation that introduces us to the topic to which we are discussing. Here you have my contact information. I coordinate the journalism career in uh, San Francisco de Quito University in Ecuador. Let's begin with what are the macro concepts around coverage, scientific coverage focused with coast resilience. To begin with, while humanity continues growing, more risks exist and the disasters are not 
phenomenons that occur in nature because they have existed and they will continue to exist with or without us. They're associated with to the influence or the acti human activities. There are, for example, inundations that are not considered uh, to affect people directly or a particular society or a community always when there is no human settlement near. However, there are others that can generate death or, or cause grave um, devastations because there are close human settlements. Meanwhile, more people live on the planet, we have to confront more risks. Let's begin with the uh, UN definition for disasters and likewise for resilience. And the UN tells us that disaster is an interruption in the functioning of a community that causes a great amount of deaths, losses, economic and material losses, and exceeds the capacity of the community or society to confront the situation when we are not prepared to confront these phenomena. Likewise, the United Nations provides us information to understand resilience in the community, which is the ability of any urban system to maintain continuity after impacts or catastrophes, while it positively contributes to the adaptation and transformation. Here, we all help each other and we have to help each other work as a team and in the network to be prepared in the three moments that we have to confront in front of an emergency before, during, and after. The UN defines a strategy, a cycle of management of risk and disaster, that the red point is a disaster, but before that, there is a preparation that provides me a response, rehabilitation and recuperation, and then prevention and mitigation. Like the journalists have to be involved in each phase of this cycle, of this circle. We have to cover the, the moments in all of its areas and all of the circumstances, not just in the red point, which what is what usually occurs. What happens with the news? Half of the human and economic damages in the last 50 years have to do with water and climate. Today, overall, we see that the environmental issues take more force in the breaking news or in the day-to-day -day news of all the means of communication, local, national, and international. But I want to stop a little bit to explain the moments of coverage. I'm not, I'm not going to cover during. I will share the link with you, but I want to share with you the before and after, the moments that we tend to forget. To report is also to educate. It's a mission that we have as journalists. The opportune information, if it's provided before, during, and after in these three moments, can save lives, literally. Likewise, on the other hand, the information that is not opportune or lack of information that is combined with something false, erroneous, or real can kill, literally. And I think that we learn this and we have lived this during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the before, uh, prevention culture likewise is news. And many of my colleagues, when they hear me, they probably ask themselves, the media doesn't buy that, but we have to find the way of selling, making a better pitch, which consists in giving good news and giving a solution focus that our audiences consume more and prefer to search for this type of news instead of the sad and desolating news of deaths or that don't have any hope or any good result. What goes in the focus of before? How is the community prepared to confront a risk? What does the community know about the risks? And what does it do to mitigate these risks? 
what tends to happen is that when everything is good, we forget to report. But we have to promote a culture of prevention and hear the journalistic uh, knows when we as journalists don't lose our capacity of surprise. If a community was able to collect water from the ocean to for their plants and to remove the salt, that's a, a demonstration of resilience. And we can explain this and we shouldn't be surprised, not be surprised over these news. What I have collected as an example very quickly is a news of the El Nino phenomenon that affects the entire Pacific coast. And obviously Ecuador is affected. It just came out two days ago, the 25th of September. And it's a news that explains on the scientific side what are the main concepts to understand the El Nino phenomenon and the changes that we are seeing in this last year? This is a digital, journalistic, and I quickly found a news connected to a pre prevention culture. This is changing the media. I clicked. I will stop my... I will stop sharing to go back to the presentation. And I will share my screen once more. Okay. Let's go to the next. The next that I will highlight uh, due to time, I will only leave it here. We do this, the coverage of during, but what we can't... Uh, articulate is to make the adequate questions. Let's not ask questions when there's an emergency, emotional questions that could affect the people directly. If someone lost their house or they're confronting the cadavers of their families, we're not going to ask them how they're doing, how do they feel, or what happened. We have some local examples. I will disactivate it and I will stop sharing for a moment. And we have these examples left here. I will go through some examples very quickly. This is from a TV channel, an Ecuadorian TV channel. There is likewise from a international TV channel, but I will go directly to the moment of afterwards. Okay, I will share once more. Okay, can you see my screen in later, which is something that we tend to forget. And here is where we have to rescue the resilience of the people. What fundamental questions can we collect in coverage of later? What has it done to lift itself up? What does it do to prepare for the future? What is it advised to the new generations to confront these types of risks? And we have to learn to live with the experience, teaches this um, community work, and it's an example for the future. Here's where we have to reinforce journalism focused on solutions. Here I have set an example, a recent article from a different um, histories and frontiers, historias y fronteras, a story between Mexico and the United States, all from DJN, you know, as a source of financing. It is um, Historias sin fronteras, likewise just published a report of the deforestation of aquatic forests and they finance collaborative um, actions between colleagues of different countries, in this case, Chile and Peru. So we can find sources of financing, external sources of financing to work on these types of issues. They shouldn't be just in the joint efforts or, or in the specific moment of during the emergency here. I leave my contact information to keep ourselves connected and informed. Likewise, I invite you to know and to visit the San Francisco website and the inter-university um, library of which I am also part. I will stop sharing my screen and I think was able to fulfill with the time parameters. Go ahead, Lucy. Thank you, Tanya. Excellent. 
very good for you. Mining is more population. There is more impacts to the population because all human action has an impact. And likewise, thank you for reminding us that we have to um, be receive more training to be more sensitive and to generate communication, assertive communication, instead of generating more panic in the population. Now we'll, we will give the floor to Victor Garcia, who will focus on commenting what is an integral management plan of disasters, who should prepare this plan, and why is it important that journalists know about the issue and we should start to produce reportings to question those in charge of these resilience plans. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in this seminar. Overall, because the journalism has a great importance for the international agendas and for the issues that we'll be discussing today that have to do with sustainable management, the climate change and the disaster risks, and likewise, the management of the marine and coastal areas. First of all, I'd just like to, the, is the network, Redulac, is a university network of the Latin America and the Caribbean, was founded in 2006. We have existed 17 years since our foundation, and we are integrated by 100 universities of the Americas and the Caribbean that has to do with disasters, climate change, and sustainable development. In this way, we carry out projects in the universities and we collaborate with scientific council of the countries. Okay, first of all, we would have to say that resilience is a social construction. We can educate from our birth, since we are not no longer exist in this world, to have conducts and resiliences capable of confronting the confrises and from there have less impacts, we can build resilience as a preventive function and perspective before we have an event, during the event, and after the event. Likewise, it's a continuous project of the human being. And in the coast, likewise, there is an effect of resilience due to its structure that we will review shortly. The first thing is that we have to understand that resilience is integrated by components. It's made of components. A very important component is the natural means, the manglards, the rifts, the marine herbs, islands, and other types of structures that exist in the marine coastal areas. This makes us, causes us the need to know the territory. What are its dimensions, are its characteristics, its capacities, what issues are they confronting with contamination and with all of the issues that we are currently having in general. Then, this interacts with the social means that especially because they are zones with excellent means of life. So here we have, we in this interaction, we can make a correct presentation of the natural means to take advantage of it or talk about the incorrect use. While we have more lack of equilibrium in an ecosystem, the greater fragility and such so ability to suffer impacts such as disasters. So this because the means of life that we utilize in these zones, the fishing, the ports that we install, commerce, industries, deposits of um, fuels, great activities that we have in this area, utilize these um, natural areas and produce impacts. So we should study these characteristics. The marine coastal area will resist an impact that we will provoke in the future of absorbing it, of recuperating it if we damage it in any way, of ad adapting naturally and of transforming. Or if we, instead of provoking this impact, we will cultivate through our resistance and 
learn to resist and to absorb and to re adapt and to transform of human activity that we'll be carrying out. And this can't won't become it make it fragile in view of a disaster. Right now, we are utilizing we before the cycle of disasters of prevention, mitigation, preparation, responses, and rehabilitation, which was a cycle that the University of Wisconsin produced, and it is well known around the 40s to confront inundations or these types of issues. However, from 2015, 2016, that the new dictionary with the United Nations was approved, and we're talking about respective management, was to avoid the construction of risk, the corrective management, which is to correct what we have done incorrectly, and the compensatory action has to do with two parts, preparation and response for a to actually confront an uh, event of crisis. And then after the event, the rehabilitation and recuperation and what we call reconstruction in a better way. So to continue increasing these standards that provide security and capacity to once again, absorb and recuperate. Why is this important in the marine coastal areas and why resilience is urgency that we have to work on right now as our presenter and before prior presenter said the greater impacts are uh, hydro are water-based and are increasing in their severity they are adverse events that are irregular so we have to even though we have uh, a winter situation with a relatively low rain but concentrated in extreme events so there is a variability of the climate that has been changed due to human actions. What are these big indicators that we have to control in the marine coastal areas? The greatest threat is the increase of the ocean levels, the amount of investments, um, shrimp farms, hotels. These are practically introduced on the coast under what we call a quote, which is a level where the ocean can arrive. If we calculate that the ocean has increased at 50 centimeters on average, but will continue increasing and it can reach various meters high, we have to measure how each of these structures are. And then see, according to the level of the ocean, how long they have to continue to live, what adaptation means we have to make in these structures for resilience. And then later, if we can move these areas of greater resilience. The marine intrusions, now the waves when there are uh, ocean waves, if the sea levels have increased, its capacity of introducing within the territory on land increases. So we have temporary effects or permanent effects of marine intrusion, which are principally to synthesize the land. This water that comes out is evaporated and the salt is in this territory. This of torment or hurricane, we have a great example in um, 2013, 2011 in Japan, excuse me, in which the handling that was seen after um, the and 23 people were affected, there was a wall, a defense wall that likewise impeded for the water to return back again. And this water stayed on land and the territory was um colonized the land has not been recuperated today another important variable is wind we talk about structures the coast structures are relatively fragile from um, wood and wino which are very little resilient to the cities of wind and then temperature of the structures that we build in these areas will always be affected and this will implicate the need of situating them in a different way to confront the heat and have better ventilation or the consumption of fuels to maintain the temperature within these levels and the precipitation levels that we could have in one day 40 millimeters of water but now we can have 10 or 15 minutes or half an hour this varies the uh, the capacity of the roads of the marine coastal areas. So this quick um, accumulation can damage systems, marine coastal systems. 
So the three main elements to generate resilience, marine coastal resilience is location, design, and maintenance. The idea is to avoid erosion, deforestation, to build uh, dead areas, infrastructure that has capacity to have a greater interaction with waves and all of these different aspects. Likewise, to put attention to the change of the water pH salinization, when there's a greater temperature and greater evaporization, then the, um, the alterations likewise of the territory that we produce with fishing and with other interventions. This is a great example from 1970 to date, we have only 50 years. Cancun was a natural area that we can see in the first page and the area that we have created in the second page. This is an area that if we have an increase of at least 12 to five meters of water, then it cannot be utilized because it will disappear. Here we do not build thinking about climate change and we continue building without making resilience uh, plans. There are others where the mangroves have been lost and we try to recuperate these plantations where they were when in reality we shouldn't do it where they were but to cover greater areas to generate when the sea level is going to have the minglars in this area to set an example this is a, a prospect actions the journalists in general the Marco, the Sendai framework says two types of stakeholders, the government stakeholders and private stakeholders. And we have civil society, academic sector where we are, journalism and the private sector. These stakeholders have a right to a table and an exposition in each of the world tables. But it's not to, we can't, the journalism table is not occupied. And this is something we have to change. This organization that you direct could be that that leads the possibility of having a positive incidence in communication in the international frameworks. When we speak about this, can motivate social movements, can form stakeholders that develop, can generate governance and governability in the issue. The 12 minutes have gone by. I think that the main challenge then is to form journalism with an informative vision. For this, we have to create courses, we have to create a series of programs so that journalists can be trained and informed with knowledge because with report with sensationalism is easy, but with knowledge needs training. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for your intervention. I rescue the importance of environmental education. As you mentioned, resilience is a social construction. Likewise, it's a continuous process, and we thank you if you can share a link for this dictionary with the current terminology of how we should communicate disasters. So as reporters, we continue training ourselves and reporting in our audiences in a better manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. I give the floor to Rosario Calderon from WWF Mesoamerica, who will talk to us about the Coast and how this project has contributed for the communities, participating communities have found solutions based on nature to generate resilience in their communities. Thank you, Rosario. You have the floor. Thank you, Lucy, for this invitation. And I will share my screen with the presentation that I have for today. One second. It's a pleasure to share this moment with you and to tell you a little bit about what we did with the Ready Coast Project, which is a legacy for the Recifal Meso Mesoamerican area, or this is how we would like to view it. This project, five years, Rosario, we're not seeing the presentation yet. Can you see it now? 
Thank you, Lucy. Costas Listas is a project that was carried out during five years in the Recifal Mesoamerican area. The original name is Integrating Climate Change in Protected Marine Areas and Coastal Management in the um, Mesoamerican area. It's this area that you can see here in blue. It's one of the areas that's more vulnerable um, due to climate change. Is more vulnerable areas in view of climate change in the world. And there the importance of carrying out projects such as this one. These are the allies of the project it's not an effort that we made alone, but this is with funds of the initiative of Germany. And we have seen it with the Stanford University and Columbia University. And locally, we exchanged it with different stakeholders who made this possible in the local implementations. This project utilized science in the best way possible with the support of the Stanford University in Columbia and likewise data from NASA. And existed how the communities perceive that was and we carried out in a local investigation with communities to have data and to that counteracted with science. This was one of the issues, innovating issues of this part, not just based on scientific data, that people tell us that here before in my partial, it was very easy to cultivate um, this type of plant, but now due to the droughts, it's no longer possible. It used to rain um, this way, and now it, it rains constantly, or now it has changed from a certain type, or the days of heat have increased in a certain manner, etc. All of this information was very relevant to build data that could support us. It was a very part participative process, I want to highlight that the importance of having a series of workshops and analysis so that people could participate and could tell us in the field how they analyze things and where it was more of a priority through this. Through this, we had data that, data that could give us some type of projection of how this could work in the future. Here I am sharing an example of the extreme days of heat that we'll be living through by year. And if we see for the year of 2050, it will duplicate the days, extreme days of heat. All of these results we have available and we can share these with you. There's a series of results. This is just an example, but we're also speaking of droughts. Apart from all of this data, all of this process that I have shared with you carried us to, or carried the experts to identify the means of adaptation to carry out different projects identified by the project. We saw what the priorities were for each area of the previously selected areas. So here there are different types of strategies, a means of adaptation, such as restoration of the basin, protection of the, which is a different thing, carry out sustainable agricultural restoration of manglars, protection of manglars, protection of coral, restoration of coral, restore um, coastal dunes. This was an important means for Mexico, correct, to protect the marine um, grass, handling fire and agricultural um, means. For some countries, this was more of a priority than for others. I think that this is a very relevant and important information. So the authorities in the field in these countries can adapt this knowledge 
which is for making decisions. For each means of adaptation, we identified the locations where implementation could carry the impact positive in a co the coastal area. And we created maps, priority maps for the social local areas to help them to consider where to implement each strategy. So this is an example, correct? This is the region, but specifically in these points is where we need, for example, to conserve the manglers or protect them. For each means of adaptation, we made these maps that are available for the authorities and for the associates can continue with their implementation. It's worthy to highlight that some adaptation means of those previously identified exa case examples were made in the field, but there are many more that need from continuity and the support of the local governments and national governments and of the communities and of base organizations to carry these actions out. We had many communication means for the community so they could better understand about climate change and the importance of adapting because it's no longer an issue of doubting if this will happen or not. It's a fact. And the question now is, to make people aware of the importance of adapting yourself. We had a radio, radio uh, soap opera that's now a podcast and now in cartoons that we amply spread. So in 10 episodes, we could tell a story that was easier to understand for these populations. It's still available and still current in case you would like to see it. Based on this, we carried out some tests to identify if the populations were understanding the content. We carried out some exercise of art to the communities could write down or draw what they understood, especially in communities that don't have that much access to reading and writing, but can draw what they understand. We left some material with stories, short stories. So this message can be written down about the adaptation in view of climate change. There were other in initiatives and other actions that we carried out for a regional journalistic workshop where we shared all of this knowledge in a more explicit manner, such as we're explaining today. This is also online. I can share it with you in case you'd like to have more specific data, especially for each country based on this workshop, we have a journalistic course where, for example, this one down below is the pieces that we were able to spread. The reporters were also very receptive to publish these parts of what we want to promote because we are the journalists who support the discussion of this type of content. We had some testimonies that help people are living um, in the field to create more awareness about this. Likewise, we had some kits of ambassadors so that important members of the community, some leaders could move all of this information in an easy to understand language for the rest of the communities. This is all the information that is likewise available. In conclusion, this is a project that uses scientists and local information to find the means of adaptation to climate change in areas to the um, reef Miss American areas so that the communities can be better prepared in view of climate change. All of this, as I say, is in, available. We have provided it to the authorities so that on the coasts and of Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras can utilize this information to continue implementing these means of adaptation. For more information, I will write down here my email. This information is what I can share with you here in the, in the link so that you can enter and have all of this information. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Rosario.
How interesting all that you have mentioned to take into account the local knowledge, to take into account the people involved that the intervention that is carried out in the community can be successful. Thank you very much. And I remind everyone to write their questions in the Q&A function so that we can propose these questions to the presenter or speaker. This um, seminar is being recorded and you will receive a link so you can see it again. While I view your question, I have a question for Dr. Garcia. I'd like to know, Dr. Garcia, if you could tell us if you have knowledge of a success story of a community that implemented a disaster risk integral plan and what makes a plan successful to reduce impacts of natural phenomena? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, in the voluntary program of San Carlos and in some other of the center of disasters, we have supported a community that's called Monte Rico, where there's a protected area of marine turtles. And we have a center of adaptation of eggs and of turtle reproduction. We have helped this zone for the repopulation. And we do it with volunteers who go to the community to train individuals. We do this with cleaning of trash and we, you know, everything is damage the turtles and with the accompaniment of governmental entities and of security, we have contributed to capturing drink eggs to reproduce these and then liberate these and in a free manner in coordination with the tourist environmental awareness. This is a protection of a species that has the University of San Carlos, which is successful. So the question Machaca, which is for the protection of the, it's a interchange area where there a river goes into the ocean and there's the a success story of conservation of Manatee. And there's a plan specifically for these species for municipal plans that have to do with these. I haven't been able to work on them. I've worked on other types of municipalities but a plan of Marine Coast, and I've not had the pleasure of working with them. This would be an interesting challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Very quickly in general for independent community, if it's on the coast or not, who should lead the development of this integral management? This is destined to the municipalities from up the provinces or departments. The person who should lead the, the plan is the mayor. We've had many experiences where we promote a plan, but the mayor is not interested. So the situation fails. The mayor should be the person in charge. This is an attribution. If he doesn't do this, this is a evasion of his responsibilities. He is the main person in charge, municipal council. And of course, to organize a commission, a main office of disaster risk management, a commission, with participation of all the local stakeholders to build it in a participant manner. There are many methodologies. We can discuss many um, experiences even if they're not on the coast, but the leadership of the major is the most important. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. I have a question now for Rosario. We are asked, what makes a restoration project successful? What makes a restoration project successful? Thank you, Lucy. I think that in this case, I'm not a technician. I just um, want to clarify that I work on communication, but I have heard my colleagues and I have learned that one of the issue is to involve all of the involved areas, those who are in charge of those who are present in the field for example, communities, local organizations, but likewise in the restoration, we have to take into account, according to what I have heard, the type of plant that will be planted or the type of forest coverage, because often it's not native to the area. And this has a lot to do in the restoration. We now have, it, it's in, spell the issue of reforestation. For example, 
but sometimes it's done inadequately because it's too close. The plantation is, the one tree is too close to the other, or it's not native to the area, and it becomes a plague instead of restoration process. I think the most adequate things to have the support of an expert in the issue a forest engineer that can support this process to carry it out adequately and to have a restoration to do what originally was present in the field. Thank you very much. I invite Tanya. Mm -hmm. One question for Tanya. From your presentations, Rosario mentioned, for example, that what they produce in the a ready area coasts. Those who could comment, Tanya, you uh, with this experience in science journalism, how the reporters can take this into account, how to select, how to know, how to take into account to give it a greater, how do people can understand to make decisions based on science and at the same time that it's important to take this into the traditional knowledge into it. So I'd like to know for you to tell us a little bit about this and you can tell us what tips can you give us to find interesting stories about the situation of the climate impact on the coast and to present these to the public so they become interested in them and they're not scared of course, because to not generate more panic. What tips do you give us? Thank you, Lucy. Various issues. As a journalist, it's not a lack of interest to generate more content with a focused on the environment. It's lack of adequate remunerations and cost to delve deep into the issue. So, so I invite you to continue searching for other uh, sources of financing external to your countries, and they do exist. This doesn't happen with public institutions of our countries in Latin America where the public policy doesn't work correctly, but there's international organizations that promote these initiatives and can, apart from providing financial training, they provide scholarships that accompany the journalist, the young journalist, or any age, and can offer editorial commitment to provide to provide quality journals, to open the spectrum. Not, we shouldn't believe that your music communication where you work should be your main clients. To have a good pitch implies that we have to maintain my capacity of shock in view of each circumstance, and especially when it's international. For the external clients, everything that has to do with the Amazon and with indigenous communities and with social and environmental conflicts. I'm not speaking just of the issue that has to do with of nature, but with the peoples and with the communities, these will always be attractive. And the question, fundamental question, and I also say in class, and we have to answer when we make a pitch, what is the news of my issue? What's but will I say new that hasn't been said before? And there's always something new. With this, taking the first, what you said, Lucy, when I find scientific documents and to have an explanation, and I thank the professionals who are here at Rosario and Victor to have an explanation of the technical personnel who has handled or leaded these processes because we can have the documents, but we're not experts. And probably we will not understand them with all the story behind them. There are people that work on turtles, for example, all their life, but a journalist doesn't work with turtles all of his life. He could be today in a manifestation, tomorrow on the beach with illegal fishing of sharks, and the next day in the Amazon. So we do need to have this connection of the scientific community to explain to us as if we were children. You're introducing a subject and it can be facility of context. Many times 
uh, journalists are blocked, but this is something that we shouldn't let happen because a source doesn't respond. A source um, doesn't respond to our messages, or doesn't respond to their email, or the text messages, or doesn't, we don't have a specialized witness in the scientific community, now that I'm in the academic word, people know each other and they know who handles that area in particular in which I would like to work. And then as part of the scientific um, sharing of information that we need to achieve due to time, I have one question here for Dr. Garcia. We're asked, he wrote this card, what role have the indigenous communities had if the municipalities don't have interest of carrying out integral management risk plan? We have been working now with early alert systems, for example, for climate change. And what we have done is to work with the native communities, with the individuals who have a greater age and have a timeline on the issues and these types of problems. And what we do is a reconstruction of all of these referrals and to give them value to the opinion of the community. Then we generate incidents processes between the government, the community, that unfortunately now in our time, there's a lot of um, polit politic issues in these processes of the political parties there is too many confrontations in the communities and we have to have intelligence to have political incidents and then to have an, a neutral encounter between um, authorities. Generally what happens is we have crisis instead of um, exchange and neutrality to generate incidents processes and to build social organizations. The other fundamental issue is informed participation. We really don't have the correct information and we participate, we repress the wrong thing. We act in the incorrect way or we confront the problems in, instead of the causes. The project of scientific accompaniment is very important because we have to generate this information and then afterwards to have a dialogue, strengthen with governance to support the legal system that exists and to have leaders that know how to negotiate and don't confront, because this is one of the main issues that we have of confrontation between people and authorities. Leaders have to have sufficient emotional maturity to have a dialogue that can be have a purpose with the authorities. That is my experience. I think that when the stakeholders don't want to collaborate, it's useless to participate because there's no possibility of participating. And there's no nothing in the negotiation. We have to seek means to achieve and to find common areas, common ground. And on that, we can build trust. Building trust and knowledge are two important values. And then to have leaders who can negotiate that have representativity. Many leaders do not have representativity. And this generates processes that are not of the social basis. Thank you very much, doctor, with your response. We have a question that goes for Rosario. We go, you said communication. How do we as communicators carry out a communication strategy that is participative for the participation? What are your tips, Rosario, so we can carry out a good communication participative strategy? I think that first, in my experience, we have seen to have an investigation about the public and their perceptions to see what bases of information exist and through what channels they are informed on and what concepts are not very clear. If there's bad information, this is a starting point essential to guarantee success in a communication plan, knowing who we are directing ourselves to and who needs to know and what we need to move and through which channels, for example. The second I think is to involve all the different parts regarding provisions on the part of the team that is carrying out the plan. If there's a technical personnel and to involve them and to involve them in all of the implementation to have, diff to have different materials, even though we know the how the content has to be validated so that we can be sure of that what we are moving is 
validated information. I think that is is essential to guarantee that we don't just have make a video just to make it or a pamphlet to make it and distribute it. And with this, we fulfill. It should obey our audience and what we want to communicate. This is essential. Thank you, Rosario. To not take more time, I just ask each panelist to please offer a final reflection about this issue. How should we coastal resilience be in Latin America? How can we promote it? Maybe we have 30 seconds for each person. Let's begin with Dr. Garcia. The word coastal resilience is a priority issue of vital importance. Land can be here always and always without us. We are the ones who depend on our survival and our means of life of these areas that are so productive. And what we have to have is a construction of plans of use of these territories based on four processes, social articular reading of the of reality, social par participation, social mobilization, and pol political um, mobilization. Thank you, Rosario, please. I think that to begin with, let's put the issue on the agenda correct, on the agenda at every level, because sometimes these issues are more related to with something of a less importance. And for our countries in Latin America, due to the conditions that we have, this is a key issue. The resilience is very important. And to find it is, is not proper. It's very important to put the point in the agenda. This is how we, we start to give it the priority that is required to understand it. Sometimes we complain about the days of heat that we're currently living through or the changes and we say it's, it's terrible. We don't know the other years in the region that we have each year will get worse. So we have to put this in the agenda and that's how we can begin. Before giving the floor to Tanya, I remind you please fill a small survey to give us your comments about this seminar and to please remember to register to our network visiting our website. Tanya, I give you the floor for your reflection for all of our journalists. How should we treat this very important issue for us? Adding to what my colleagues have stated, I think that likewise we have to start to understand what we're living through. If we understand what's happening, then we can explain it. That's the next moment that journalism demands, right? Now, to explain the phenomenons and we explain them with a hope. We as citizens need hope. I think that we didn't connect an issue that is growing in the marine coastal area, which is drug trafficking and human trafficking, which is creating conflictivity in the intervention areas in many countries. We should put this in the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your valuable intervention, for the information you have shared with us. Thank you to the entire auditorium and audience who has joined. We thank you for your time. And we hope that everyone as journalists and communicators are motivated to create proper material that contributes to improve the situation of our planet. And I remind you that the next few days, you'll be receiving the connection to the link to to the seminar so you can see it again and we'll be sending you the presentation of our presenters so you can be contacted and it's a pleasure and I desire everyone to have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.